rejoice in what the Lord's done in the last week and what He's continuing to do. And um, Lord willing, this afternoon, um, we're going to have a couple baptisms. And I wanted to teach us on baptism. I want to take some time and teach us about it. And it'll probably go on longer than t today. I already, looking at the time, I'm like, Phew. you all know how I am. So it'll probably be for a few weeks. Um, we'll be gone next week. We're going to be at a missions conference in Wyoming with uh, uh, Glen Rock Baptist Church. So we'll be up there for that. But when I come back, I'll probably continue this. Um, but with that, you know, both the people that are wanting baptism, both sought sought it out and that's what we want we want it to be the people seeking it out the people seeing that this is what god wants them to do and because god wants them to do it that's why they're doing it now i have no problem teaching them and saying god commands you to be baptized every person that's saved god has commanded you to be baptized and you need to be baptized because god has commanded it um, but also i'm not going to force it on you um, that's foolish i think and that's how you know Look here, we're talking about young children getting saved. And it can cause a lot of confusion if we tell them that they're saved. Mm -hmm. And here's something with young children. Most any of us, if they make a confession of faith, and then you baptize them, and they're not saved, they're going to remember getting baptized. And if you're in any type of church that teaches even close to the truth, then that child's going to grow up learning that you have to be saved first, and then you get baptized. There's an order, and we'll talk about that. Repentance before faith, faith before the water, water before the table. Okay, talking about the Lord's table. Okay, repentance has to come first, and then faith, and that's your salvation. And that comes before the water, the waters of baptism. Okay, that's the order that God has given it in. All right, but a child, if, if, we, if they're not saved or we think they're saved and they get baptized and they're not saved, they're going to remember the baptism and the baptism is going to stick in their mind and they're going to say, no, I've been baptized, I must be saved. Um, my own daughter's testimony was that she says, no, I, I, one of them said that, you know, no, so-and-so said I was saved. So-and-so said I was saved. So-and-so said I was saved. I must be saved. And that's what she said, and they've been told that, so they think that they're saved. And I don't ever want us to do that. Um, I've, just as I've come through this thing and, and learned, I've just, confessing here myself, I've done it wrong with every one of my children. Every one of them, I've done it wrong. Okay, instead of letting God bring them to salvation, letting them confess it with their mouth, they, they said it, they prayed a prayer, and then I, I'm like, yes, my child's saved, and I'm telling people they're saved. Now, thank God I never told my child that, oh, no, you're saved, you're saved, that I can recall. And I asked them, too, did I ever tell you guys that? And they said, no, I can't remember, and I don't want to be guilty of that. Um, so as we're, we're looking at this and we're looking at baptism, you know, the people that, that we're going to baptize today came asking, seeking out baptism. And that's what it is. And there's some others here that need to be baptized, but I'm not going to put that on them. That's on you. God says you need to do it. Do it. I mean, we've got our Baptist forefathers died for it. So why wouldn't you? And God's commanded it. God, Jesus Christ himself on earth, traveled over 60 miles, 60 to 70 miles to get the right baptism. All right, so it is important, and I, wanna, I want us to understand that. So we're going to look at baptism, and I hope I can give us some, some understanding here. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, it says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. 
I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you and just we're asking you, Lord, to, I'm asking you to help me. God, I need your help in explaining this and teaching it. And Lord, that it would be something our church would understand. And um, even some visitors here, Lord, maybe they could get some insights on what baptism really is and the importance of it. Um, there's so much in this, Lord. Just please help me to keep my thoughts straight. And Father, if there's somebody here that does not know you as Savior, they've never come to repentance and faith, I pray that right now, Lord God, they would. I pray you burden their heart. And God, just the whole service, just don't let go of them. Don't, don't let loose of them and, and just break them, Lord, and bring them to repentance and faith in you, Lord, and that they would know that their sins are forgiven if they've never done that, Lord. And please, I just ask you to help me as I, I preach and teach your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to get back to Matthew chapter 3. But I want to ask you a question. Why were so many martyrs killed throughout history? Why have so many Christians been killed throughout history? And really, I, I encourage you, get some of these books that Brother Paulman's been talking about. Order Martyr's Mirror. It's an excellent book. Why are these people being killed throughout history? And there's one reason and one reason only why they're being killed, why, why people have been persecuted. He mentioned a lot of the persecution that happened in colonial America and John Leland um, sitting there with James Madison and, and Patrick Henry and having these discussions with them and saying, we're not going to compromise. We're done. We're no more toleration. We're not compromising on this. We, we're we're going to demand that there's religious liberties. You can thank Baptists for the Bill of Rights. All right, but why did they do that? Why were they being persecuted then? Why, you know, even reading through the book of Acts, why are they being persecuted and on through? And it comes down to one thing, one issue, and it all has to do with authority. That's why all this persecution has taken place throughout history. It has to do with authority. Now, you may look at it and say, well, it's because they were baptizing infants. Yes, that's a truth. But before that, it was, you know, you need to give a, a pinch of incense to Caesar. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. Why? Because they said, we have one king, it's Jesus. He's our king. You get into colonial America and the cry of the, the revolution was no king but Jesus. Okay, that's what they're, they're crying out. So it all, ha it all comes down to authority. So yes, you could say it's infant baptism, but, but why did they reject infant baptism? See, that's the, the argument that a lot of people make is they say, oh, well, it was, you know, Baptists, we rejected infant baptism. No, we were dying for baptism long before then, Amen. long before infant baptism was around. Infant baptism was just proof that they were a corruption and they weren't a church. Amen. Since they weren't one of the Lord's churches, therefore they had no authority. They didn't have the authority. And that's what it always comes down to. And by the way, you know, Baptist people, we're facing that same stuff again today. They're telling us we have to believe a certain way. It's authority. They don't have the authority to be able to tell me what to think. They don't have the authority to tell me I have to accept gay marriage. You don't have the authority to do that. I don't have to accept that. That's a sin against God. It's an abomination. Right. That is no marriage. God doesn't even recognize it as marriage. That's right. He'll never recognize that as marriage. The Bible's against that. God's against it. Jesus said, in the, have you not read in the beginning He made, created them male and female? Right. There it is. He just defined it for us. Yeah. He came out against gay marriage. See, they're, they're telling us we have to accept these things. Look at they're right there too. He created a male and female. Bye-bye transgenderism. That's gone. Amen. We don't have to accept it, but here's the question. Are we willing to pay a price for it? For standing for the truth? Because they did. They did pay a price for it. They were beaten, tortured, imprisoned, murdered, starved to death. All of it. Why? Because we didn't accept their authority. They, they, they were taking an authority that did not belong to them. It does not. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it starts off with all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Jesus speaking to his church. He says, all power is given unto me. He's talking about authority. I've got all authority. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. He says, I don't care if it's a closed country, go and preach. Why? Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That's where the, it's an authority issue. 
and governments have usurped authority that don't belong to them. Religious organizations have, have usurped an authority that doesn't belong to them. That's why we have all these martyrs throughout history. I wanted to read a few things for us. This is another book I recommend. Um, it's on the back table back there if you want to get a history of the Baptists by um, Orchard. Grab it back there. Let me read uh, uh, something here for you out of this. <clears throat> I'm not going to really give you all the background. I'm just going to read this and we'll jump in, okay? It says, The bishop says Moshein. Moshein was, a, I believe he was a Lutheran historian. Now aspired to higher degrees of power and authority than they formerly possessed. It's talking about the bishops of churches, okay? The pastors of churches is what it's saying. Okay, to, they aspired to higher degrees of power and authority than they formerly possessed. So if they're trying to take, or they're aspiring to higher degrees of power and authority than they formerly had, that means they're taking authority that they don't have. Amen. Okay, that's what it's saying, okay? And not only violated the rights of the people, but also made gradual encroachments on the privileges of the presbyters. That they might cover their usurpations with an air of justice and appearance of reason, they published new doctrines concerning the nature of the church and Episcopal dignity. See, so we're going to corrupt what the church is. We're going to change what the church is. We're going to pass these new doctrines. We're going to speak, you know, <clears throat> ex cathedra, as the Pope would say, from the chair, and now I've got this authority. That's what they're doing. They're doing the same thing. They're saying, well, yeah, the Bible says that, but... And they're going to add to it, and they're going to put something else in there. They're stealing authority that they don't have that God did not give them. So we've got it all right here. This is all we need. So they're taking an authority that they don't have. This is just follow the Catholic Church on down. This is the, the the building of the Catholic Church, by the way, what you see, what we're reading about right here. All right, so they published new doctrines concerning the nature of the church and episcopal dignity. One of the principal authors of this change in the government of the church was Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage, AD 254, who pleaded for the power of the bishops with more zeal and vehemence than had ever been hitherto employed in that cause. The bishops assumed in many places princely authority. So now they're princes. I'm a ruler now. See, Baptists have always believed in a separation of church and state. All right? They're two different kingdoms. Keep them separate. All right? Always believed in that. But they assumed in many places. Let me just say, when you join church and state together, whenever church and state come together, you will always, every single time, you will never not have it persecution. So whenever church and state come together you will always have persecution. Okay, look at Islam. Sharia law, persecution. All right, look about um, what the Catholic Church did throughout the Dark Ages. All right, persecution, church and state coming together. What the Protestants do throughout Europe and colonial America, persecution. Every single time. All right, every single time it's persecution. It's never not been. It will always be. All right. By the way, communist countries, they say they don't have a religion. They do. It's worship. You know, self-worship government is essentially what it is. In China, that's what's going on right there. And what do you have there when you bring church and state together? The official Chinese church, they want to call it, but they, you know, teach, you know, communist doctrine is what they want the preachers preaching. And what do you have? Persecution for those that don't fall in line. Happening today in China. They're destroying meeting houses in China today. Why? Because church and state together, persecution. Okay. So the bishops assumed in many places princely authority, particularly those who had the greatest number of churches under their inspection. So you got these guys, and they were called metropolitans is what it ended up being, but they'd be in a big city, and they'd get a big church, okay? And then um, they'd have these other churches basically under their authority. Maybe it was churches that they previously started or, or a pastor before them um, uh, under the, the guise of that church. They'd gone out and started these churches, and now they're assuming authority over these other churches within their region, and they're dictating to them what they can and can't do. That's what's going on here, okay? So particularly those, those bishops or pastors who had the greatest number of churches under their inspection and who presided over the most opulent assemblies. They appropriated to their evangelical function, the sp functions the splendid ensigns of imperial majesty. So there it is, church and state. A throne surrounded with ministers exalted above his equals, that's what they were doing, was the servant of the meek and humble Jesus. So they're supposed to be servants of the meek and humble Jesus, but they're uh, exalted above all their equals. This is when you begin to get a clergy laity class, okay? You are not laymen, and I'm not clergy, Amen. okay? The members of this church, we're all equal. Amen. Every one of us here is equal, okay? Some of you aren't members here, but the members of this church are all equal. I don't have any uh, more uh, authority than anyone else. I've been given a different position, and in that position, I have to, to, to lead and, and direct this church, but it's always under the guise of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
It's always under Him. And you're about to see as, as we come and have these baptisms, we're gonna, the membership of this church is going to make a decision. And we all have just as much say. And I'm just going to kind of jump ahead right now, but this church goes by oneness, unity. Okay, on the decision. So if one opposes decisions we're going to make, that's the Holy Spirit saying, stop. God's not in that. Now, we may have questions for that one that's opposing it. Why? And maybe we can work it out and find and all be in unity. But that's how it works. We want to be in unity, or as old timers have said it, oneness. They practiced a policy of oneness, meaning we're in unity. We're all in agreement. But nobody has more power or authority than anybody else, just different positions as they've been placed in this body, okay? All right, so it says, A throne surrounded with ministers exalted above his equals was the servant of the meek and humble Jesus. And sumptuous garments dazzled the eyes and minds of the multitudes into an arrogant veneration for their arrogated authority. Now, what does that mean? Their arrogated authority, it means they assumed or claimed as their own authority. Now, what's it talking about? I want to just break down what it says, okay? So they had all these, you know, religious-looking garments. Okay, they dazzled everybody. And what they did is they arrogated or they took authority that wasn't theirs. And they began persecuting those that didn't follow, that didn't fall in line with them. And that's what began to happen. It was a usurping of an authority that did not belong to them. This is why martyrs have been killed throughout history. I want to read us a few more things. And, you know, I hope to get it as far as I can, but I really want us to understand this issue of authority. So this is out of Martyr's Mirror. And it says right here in A.D. Uh, 317, Donatists, these are known as the Donatists. Um, they were in Africa. But it says, Donatists, an overlearned bishop at Carthage who had many adherents in Africa, taught among other things. Now here's what he taught. That the preaching of the divine word and the administration of the sacraments by an ungodly minister. Okay, he's talking about uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And the administration of the sacraments by an ungodly minister were of no avail. They... His followers held that the church of Christ existed only among them, and hence they rebaptized all who wished to adopt their religion, saying that the heretics or the Pope had no Christian church and consequently no baptism, inasmuch as there was only one God, one faith, one gospel, one church, and one baptism. They, like the Anabaptists, also held, says Frank, that no children even in the extremity of death should be baptized, but only believing adults who desired it. When he was imprisoned, he upbraided Augustine, saying that no one ought to be imprisoned on account of his faith. God had given man his free will to believe as he chose. It's an issue of authority. Amen. And Donatus, you know, he debated with Augustine. You, you get into most church history, most Protestant church history, you're going to hear that Augustine's like the greatest thing that's ever been. Okay? He, he's best thing since sliced bread. I mean, Augustine's just great. And he was a heretic. And the Baptists debated them and were persecuted for it. Let me read one more thing here. All right. This is, it's a little lengthy. I'm going to try and go through it. It's a conversation back and forth is what it is. But I want you to get the, the context of what's happening here. All right, and then see what he says. Okay, Maximus was a pious Christian. After many torments, he was stoned to death at Ephesus about the year 255, okay? So this is, what's that, about 1,700 years ago. All right. It says, It is stated that shortly after the death of uh, Peonius and the preceding martyrs, there suffered a certain pious Christian called Maximus, a citizen of Ephesus, concerning whom we, in order to present the matter in the briefest, clearest, and plainest manner, shall, instead of the testimony of the fathers, copy the records themselves, which were approved by the proconsul and written by the clerk of the court. So this is like the court minutes of what was happening, okay? They read thus, Maximus, a citizen of Ephesus, having been apprehended and brought before Optimus, the proconsul, which was like the governor, the proconsul of Asia, the latter asked him, what is thy name? So the proconsul asked him, what is thy name? He answered, my name is Maximus. The proconsul asked, what is thy estate? Which meant whether he was freeborn or a servant. Maximus said, I belong to myself and am freeborn. Nevertheless, I am a servant of Christ and manage my own affairs. The proconsul said, art thou a Christian? Maximus replied, notwithstanding, I am a sinner. I am nevertheless a servant of Christ. 
The proconsul questioned, Knowest thou not the decrees of the invincible princes which have now been brought hither? Maximus asked back, What are they? The proconsul answered, That all the Christians are to forsake their superstitions, acknowledge the only true prince, to whose power all things are subject, and worship his gods. Okay, we got church and state being joined together, okay? That's what's happening here. Maximus said, Yea, I have heard the unjust decree of this prince or emperor, and hence have come openly to declare myself against it. The proconsul spoke, Then sacrifice to the gods. Maximus said, I sacrifice to none except to God, and I rejoice that from my childhood's days I have offered myself only to God. The proconsul again said, Sacrifice, lest I cause thee to be tormented in divers manners. Maximus said, This is just what I have always longed for. Look at, look at this. To be deprived of this temporal and frail life and thereby attain life eternal. The proconsul then commanded his soldiers to beat Maximus with sticks. While he was being beaten, the proconsul said to him, Sacrifice, Maximus, that you may be released from these torments. Maximus said, These torments which I gladly and willingly receive for the name of my Lord Jesus Christ are no torments at all. But if I apostatize from Christ, I must expect the real and everlasting torments. The proconsul therefore had him suspended on the torture stake and dreadfully tormented and said to him, See now where thou hast come to by, to by thy folly. Sacrifice therefore that thou mayest save thy life. Maximus replied, If I sacrifice not, I shall save my life. But if I do, I shall lose it. For neither thy sticks, hooks, claws, pincers, nor thy fire hurt me, nor do I feel any pain through it, because the grace of Christ abides in me. That reminds me of what Obadiah Holmes said. He was beaten almost to death, whipped almost to death, and he said, you've, you've beat me as with roses. Then the proconsul pronounced the sentence of death, which was as follows. I command that Maximus be stoned to death as an example and terror to other Christians. Here's why. Here's what the proconsul said. This is the, the Roman government here in Ephesus. Because he would not submit to the laws and sacrifice to the great Diana of Ephesus. It's authority. Authority. That's why Christians were being killed. They wouldn't submit to an unjust authority. Amen. Now the Bible says, as much as lieth in me, you know, I endeavor to live peaceably with all men. And that's what we should do. I want to live at peace with all men. But when they start telling us what we can and can't believe, we're on dangerous ground. Amen. And we have to choose either we're going to stand for Christ or we're not. Thus far extended the words which the clerk of the court himself wrote. Now the Christian who copied these records adds the following. And presently this faithful champion of Christ was taken away by the servants of Satan, brought without the city walls and stoned. While he was being led away and stoned, he thanked God with all his heart who had made him worthy to overcome the devil in the conflict and thus committed his soul into the hands of his Lord Jesus Christ. So when we begin to look at baptism, we need to recognize it's an issue of authority. You can't just declare yourself a church and go out and start baptizing. That is no baptism because you have ignored the laws that God has given us. See, the Bible says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that God is a God of order. And let me read it. It's not coming to mind. I want you to, you can turn there if you want, but as soon as I get there, I'm going to read it. It's verse 33 and 40 kind of go together. It says, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. And then verse 40 is really the one I wanted to get to. It says, let all things be done decently and in order. That's how God does everything. Look at creation. It's all orderly. Look at the seasons. Now, I praise God, spring is here. We can count on that every single year that comes through. Why? Because God is a God of order, and the way He does things is orderly. So you don't get to go outside of the order just because you say that, well, we follow the Bible, we believe the Bible, but you have usurped an authority, you've taken an authority that you never properly received. And this is why they were rejecting you know, as we looked at Donatus, he says, no, no, we don't receive those baptisms. Why? Because we don't see them as, as a legitimate authority. They are no authority. They've, they've stolen authority. They've arrogated authority. Therefore, they don't have the authority to do that. They are no church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they were saying. This is, this is a big deal. I'm telling you, people have died for what I'm talking about right now. They've given their life for it because they wouldn't submit to what some religious organization said that was yoked up with the state. And by the way, that's what the Catholic Church says today. That's how they deny all the atrocities of the Dark Ages. 
when you get into the Inquisition, they say, the Catholic Church says, oh, we never killed anyone. That was the state that you told what to do. I mean, the Pope's deposing kings. He's setting up kings. Yep. They did what the Pope said. Amen. So that's the little scapegoat on a technicality, I guess you can say it. Just like the Nazis tried to say, well, we obeyed the law. Well, yeah, when you pass laws to murder people, sure you obeyed the law. It doesn't mean it's a just law. The Nazis were still murderers of, of millions of Jews and others. They still did it. Doesn't change the fact. So just because the Catholic Church says that doesn't change the fact. For a baptism to be recognized by the Lord Jesus Christ, it must be administered by an authority or a church that He recognizes as one of His own. Yep. He has to recognize it. That means they have to follow His dictates, His protocol, the order that He has set forth. They don't get to just take it on themselves. They can't do that. You can't just pop up and say, God's called me to preach, and just, boom, you just go off and I'm starting a church here. And now I'm baptizing in the name of Jesus and I'm following everything that, that a true church believes. I'm following everything the Word of God says, except one, you, you didn't get the authority to go do it. You stole an authority that didn't belong to you. So just because something has the name of church does not mean it's a true church. That institution must be in line with the doctrine of Christ. Now, I really, there's so much I could teach on this, and, and I'm, I'm going to try not to because I want to get on to, to teaching on baptism, but I've got about 10 minutes, and I'm not going to take us past that because we've got some things we need to do. Um, I will, in the following weeks, continue teaching through this. But let's see, I'm uh, 21 now. Let me see this coming. How old am I? No, I'm not 21 now. I was 21 when I got saved. I'm, uh, everyone's like, what? Um, how old am I? I don't even know how old I am. I'm going to be 38, right? Okay, I'm going to be 38 this year. So um, 17 years ago then, I got saved. Coming up, it'll be 17 years ago I got saved. And it was about a year and a half after I got saved, we got into a church here in town, um, New Heights Baptist Church, and went there for nine years, and then we came here and started this. Um, it was when I, I saw problems when I was there, things I didn't necessarily agree with, but, you know, when you're in it, you just kind of just go with it. But as I got out and came here and I started studying the Bible for myself, I had to start begin to learn some things and, and ask, okay, well, why do we do this? You know, I, I came here, I'm like, why are we Baptist? Baptism only. I had to figure that out. It made sense to me. Yes, there's only going to be one true church and it's going to be made up of, of, of those that follow the Lord Christ. And let me back up and say there, this right here is the body of Christ. This assembly right here is the church of God. But so can another one be in another location. The church we ended up coming out of in, in, in Wyoming, they're a church. Okay, so when I say church, I'm talking about it in an institutional sense. Okay, like if I say, hey, I'm going to go to the library. Well, which one? Well, you know what I mean. You know when I finally get to one, it's going to be a specific library. But I'm just using the term library in a generic sense to mean any library. And when I finally get to a specific one, that's the one I was talking about. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, I hope that's making sense with you because terms have been so confused and polluted. All right, you say church and everyone thinks it's just some big blob out there in the sky that we just all get to be a part of. All right, that universal mystical thing that's out there that no one can see. All right, and so that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a local assembly. That's the only church the Bible knows of, okay? So we were there and began learning some things, but I came here, started this church, and had to begin studying some things. And I came across the doctrine of Christ. You can read about it in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. It says, Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Those six principles make up the doctrine of Christ. Okay, and if you connect that with 2 John 9 through 11, um, you can see any, any assembly that doesn't have that doctrine has not God. Okay, they don't have God's authority. They're not recognized as one of His churches. All right, I, I really I want you to maybe write these down and go look at them, um, but that's what it's teaching. All right, 2 John 9 through 11 talks about receive him not into your house. It's not talking about into your home. If a Jehovah's Witness comes to your home, don't let him come into your home. He's talking to a church. He's talking to a church in 2 John 9 through 11. He says, receive him not into your house. You say, how do you know he's talking to a church? Well, go to uh, 1 Timothy 3.15 and you can see that the, the church is the house of God. It's a house. All right, so again, I don't have time to like go through all of this to, to teach us all this stuff, but you know, I, I've spent you know a couple years grounding our church in these things. So anyway, come come to start looking at the doctrine of Christ and realize that the church I came out of 
didn't hold to the doctrine of Christ. All right, they didn't hold to it. They don't hold to repentance. They didn't hold to, to, to baptism. All right, therefore, since they didn't have those things, now let me just say they had repentance. If you asked them, do you believe in repentance? They'd say yes, but they redefine it. They don't define it biblically, and they change it. They make it a synonym for belief. A synonym is just another word that means the same thing. That's how they redefine it, so they're corrupting the gospel. It's preaching another gospel, and it's a serious offense. Amen. So much so that God says, if you don't have the, the doctrine of Christ, you're not my assembly. You hath not God. You don't have God there. God's not in that. A lot of people say, you know, in Matthew, um, you know, where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. You know, and I, I've prayed with some, some believers at work before, and, they, and the guy after we finished praying is like, we just had great church. I'm like, what are you talking about? That's not church. You know, because that's a universal church mentality. What's that talking about? That's talking about as a church, as we pray together. Two or three, God's in the midst of that thing. Amen. Okay, God's there when it's in a true church. That's what that's talking about. That's the context of that. Amen. But um, this stuff, doctrine's not taught in churches. I'm just telling you right now. He, he, he just said so. This is why we're reprinting all these old books. Because doctrine's not being taught. I don't care if they call themselves Baptist. It is not being taught. Most of what I got where we came out of was just shallow. I'm not saying it was unbiblical. Some of it was, but for the most part it was biblical. And if you go there, you'd say, I agree with that, but it's so shallow, it never gets very deep in what the Word of God actually says. This is why most preachers won't discuss doctrine. You sit down and try and talk doctrine with preachers, they're like and running like you got the plague or something on you. Because they don't know doctrine. And I'm not saying that to be mean or to put them down, I'm just telling you that's a truth. That's a truth. You go to a preacher's meeting, as a preacher, I go to a preacher's meeting, and it's almost never talking about doctrine. Almost never. There's two meetings, three. Three other meetings I know of where I can go and talk doctrine. And you can bring up stuff that you're trying to figure out. You might say, I'm not even sure about this. Let me throw this out at you guys. What do you think? And they'll discuss it, bounce it back and forth. That's unheard of, though. Most preachers don't talk doctrine. So anyway, church I came out of didn't have the doctrine of Christ. So I realized, I said, great. And I fought with it for, I don't know how long. It was probably like two years I fought with this. Uh, overall, as, as God's showing me some things and wrestling with it, and there was more, you know, concentrated times of me fighting with it. But for about two years, I knew I was going to have to get baptized and ordained again. And I fought it, and I, I, I knew what it was going to cost. And any preacher that recognizes he's going to have to do that, he knows what it's going to cost, and it has cost me friends. I mean, just about every preacher friend I have in the city won't talk to me now. Just about every single one of them will not talk to me. If I see them, they might say hi. Some of them won't say hi. So how do you know that? Because I've seen them and they just act like they don't see me. So I knew what it was going to cost. But I knew I had to follow God. So we began praying and, you know, through different circumstances, a long story, but the Lord led me and Brother Brad to cross paths. He sent me some books that helped me. I began talking with him on the phone, and it ended up the church that he was um, at in Wyoming. I ended up speaking with his preacher, and, you know, most everyone here knows the story. You know, I went up there to visit them, spoke with them. We discussed some doctrine, and then uh, about a couple weeks later, um, they came down under the authority of Glen Rock Baptist Church, and Brother Potter laid hands on me. Well, I was baptized first, and then Brother Potter laid hands on me because that's the order. Go to Hebrews 6. I just want you to see the order instead of hearing me tell you. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6.1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, and that's, there's only three times you're going to find that statement in the Bible, okay? It's one's right here, and the other two are in 2 John 9. Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Now look at the order here, and you can see this order throughout the Bible too. But not laying again the foundation of, here it is, repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Those six principles make up the doctrine of Christ. Repentance first, that's why I said earlier, repentance before faith. And then faith before the water. Why? Because you have repentance from dead works and a faith toward God. And then what's next? And the doctrine of baptisms. 
and then you have baptisms, okay, and then, and of laying on of hands. So Brother Potter came down here, they baptized me after the morning service right there, under the authority of Glen Rock Baptist Church, he baptized me, and then we went and ate lunch, and we came back in, and then um, they ordained me. They brought me before the church. Brother Potter laid his hands on me. We had some other preachers here as well. Um, the man that had ordained Brother Potter, and then one of the men um, that was in Brother Potter's church, another pastor there, they came down and they all laid hands on me under the authority of Glen Rock Baptist Church. And then, after that, I baptized what was previously the membership of, of a church, and then I baptized all of them. And why? Because now we were a, a, a church that was recognized by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We were a church that was standing on the foundation of the doctrine of Christ. Now we were a true church, not just a church in name only. So it's all it has to do with authority. And baptism, for it to be legitimate, has to have that authority. It's got to go back to the right source. Okay, this is why I'm going to say the, Bapti the Bible will make you Baptist. Okay, it's Amen. going to do that. The ancient Christians were Baptists. Okay, last time I looked, it was John the Baptist. That's important. That's important. Amen. All right, newer Bible translation, they want to make it John the Immerser. No, look at it. Look, it's capitalized. It's a title. John the Baptist. And Jesus sought him out. He went 60 to 70 miles to get that baptism. Why? Because it was the authoritative <laughs> baptism. It says of John, there was a man of God sent from heaven. There was a man sent from God. He had heaven's authority. And that's the only baptism you're going to find in the New Testament. Amen. I've argued with people. They say, oh, John's baptism isn't Christian baptism. Okay, great. Show me another baptism that replaced it then. I'm still waiting to hear back from them. Right. Seriously, I'm still waiting to hear back from them. This is the amount of heresy that's out there. There's no other baptism that's replaced John's baptism. Uh, let's go to Luke 7. Luke chapter 7. You think I forgot about Matthew. I didn't, but we're not getting there today. I can tell you that much. All right, Luke chapter 7. We'll pick up in verse 24. Luke seven twenty-four. Now look, if you don't love God, if you're not saved, you don't love God, you don't love His Word, none of this matters to you. I'm just, it, do, it doesn't. But if you're saved and you love God and you love the Word of God, all of this is going to be important to you. Amen. All right, and you've got a choice. You can either do what we're about to read about. You can either reject light, what the Word of God says. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You can either reject the light or you can receive the light. That's it. That's your options. If you're a saved child of God, those are the options you have. If you're going to follow what the Word of God says, that's your options. Now, if you don't care about it, then, hey, go on, go on, do your thing. It's fine with me. Seriously. I don't say that sarcastically. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Go ahead and do your thing. But you get to choose. I'm not here to force anybody to do anything. I can't. Even if I force you against your will, you still won't believe it. What good is that? I don't. That's fake. That's hypocrisy. I don't want that. That's why I want the people that want to join this church, I want you to want it. That's why you come to us. You come to this body and ask us. Not us begging you or, or telling you or kind of, you know, you don't even know what you're doing. We just kind of run you through the waters. I've seen that. I've seen people baptize, you know, children um, going through some churches, baptized three, four, five, six times every summer at VBS. Why? Because it doesn't matter. We're just doing some religious ritual. That's not what this is. Baptism's huge, and, and I want to spend more time teaching on it. I could stay here for the next two hours teaching you all on this. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, I could, and I will over time. I'm not going to do that today, but I might go another out. No. <laughs> All right, so we're there in Luke chapter 7, verse 24. It says, And when the messengers of John, that's John the Baptist, were departed, he began to, and John, John the Baptist is in prison at this point. All right, he's in jail for, uh, by the way, he was preaching politics. Okay? He was preaching politics. The government doesn't come in here and tell us what we can preach. That's a side note. Anyway, and when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind. So Jesus is saying this. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. 
But what went ye out for to see a prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Notice it's a capital B. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God. What they do? They justified God. You know what that means? They agreed with God. They were declaring through their actions that what God has said is correct. It didn't make it correct. They're just saying we're in agreement with it. And so through their actions, they justified <clears throat> They justified God, how? Being baptized with the baptism of John. So they justified God. They said, God, you're right. Well, how'd they do that? Because they were baptized with the baptism of John. Now look at the next verse, verse 30. But, but the Pharisees and lawyers, what'd they do? Rejected the counsel of God against themselves. How'd they reject the counsel of God against themselves? To their own hurt. To their own hurt. Now remember, implied in this, we have the order. What comes before baptism? Repentance and faith. Salvation. They're rejecting the counsel of God against themselves. They're, they're doing it to their own harm. They've rejected what God has said to do. The fact that they rejected God's, uh, God's uh, uh, baptism, which is what it was, John's baptism, but it was from God, was to their own hurt. They rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of John. So when someone rejects a true authoritative baptism, they're rejecting the counsel of God against themselves. Now look, it's up to you. If you say, well, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I've repented toward God and I put my faith in Jesus Christ. You know, John the Baptist, we read about it in Matthew 3. We'll get back to that. But it says he came to prepare the way of the Lord. And what was he preaching? Repentance. Repentance prepares the heart. Okay, it takes all the valleys down. So it's a straight path to the Lord. But repentance is a humbling of yourself. But he came to prepare the way. And what did he say? Bring forth therefore fruit, meat for repentance. Show me that you've repented. I want to see it in your life is what John the Baptist said. I want to see it lived out that you're really saved. That's what he said. That's what he was saying. Let's see some evidence of that. Let's see fruit proving that you're really a child of God. And that's what he wanted. That's what he was looking for. So to reject that, if you're saved, I'm not saying your baptism's not legit. If you say, well, I've been saved and I've been baptized, I don't know if it is or not. I, that's between you and the Lord. But will you honestly ask yourself, did the, did the church I, I, I got my baptism from, the the person that baptized me, did they, have, did they hold to the doctrine of Christ? Did they go seek it out from the right authority or did they usurp authority? Did they take it? Did they take something that didn't belong to them? It's not just anybody can baptize. Right. The only people you ever see in the Bible baptizing is someone that has had hands laid on them. All right, and that's key right there. The, the, the doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands is key. This verse right here, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. Look at this. Throughout all ages, world without end, meaning His church is always going to be here. In every age, His church is going to be here. Then if you believe the doctrine of Christ, that dictates then that there has to have been a true church all the way through. Amen. Even if we can't trace it, there's always been a true church. And if you believe the doctrine of Christ with the laying on of hands, then that means there had to be a man going all the way from John the Baptist to the apostles, to men like Paul, men like Titus, men like Timothy, men like Silas that have had hands laid on them. Yeah, that man's important. It's not just the authority of the church. I'm sorry. Uh-uh-uh. It is not just the authority of the church. It's both. You'll never see anything in the Bible where someone is baptized without that man having first had hands laid on him. And there needs to be a chain link succession, succession from one man to another. The doctrine of Christ dictates it has to be that way. And if we believe that verse right there, then by faith we will accept that because His church has always been here, then that means there needs to be the laying on of hands all the way through. All the way through. But that means there needs to be a true church giving th that man authority, sending him out to be able to do that. That's the same thing. We're starting this church here, Landmark Baptist Church on the east side of town. This church has authorized me under the authority of this church to go out and baptize people. 
and get a work established there. And as God leads and a man comes, then we will ordain him and send him there. And then that church, if, if it's already at the point where there's a group of people there and established, they'll have to receive him. But this church has authorized me to go do that. It's not just that a church starts churches. Yes, a church does start churches, but they've got to have the man. Amen. That's all you see in the Bible. Acts chapter 13, go read about it. The church at Antioch sent out two men. It wasn't the whole church went and did it. No, it was under the authority of that church. Amen. That's how it works. So it has to have that chain link succession. So authority in, in, in baptism is hugely important. And without it, there is no baptism. This is why our forefathers were called Anabaptists, you rebaptizers. No, we're not rebaptizing them. It was never a baptism. They just got wet. I mean, any of you that have taken a bath, you're not saying it's a baptism. Right. Who does that in church? <laughs> it's my brother-in-law. Everyone's like, oh, no, he's going to. No, it's my brother-in-law. I'm always picking on him. Yeah, I, I've had my phone ring, too, and I just use that as an excuse to tell everyone. That was my reminder to tell you, silence your phones. All right, so <laughs> I've done it from up here. That's even worse. But you've got to have the right authority. Without it, it is no church. You can't just declare yourself one. So this is kind of a, a bit of a different service here. What we're going to have now is we're going to have a, a couple um, ladies come forward, and they're going to give their testimony. And then as a church, what I'm going to have us do, the members of this church, um, if anybody really, we're going to, vote to receive them as members because they're going to be baptized. And let me just say, I wanted to get into more of this and teach more of this, but our church has gotten, gone through this. I was just, and I'm, I'm going to again, I'm going to teach us through it. But what those waters mean is so important. Amen. That is a guard to this church, to the purity of this church. God commands every single person that trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior to be baptized. It's a command of God. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So that means you teach those that you baptize, they need to teach others to be baptized because you're to teach them all things. So God has commanded that. But I will say this. Go to John chapter 4, please. I just want to. I want you to see this. See, to be a Christian means I'm going to be Christ-like. Okay, that's what the term means. It means I'm like Christ. Amen. So then let's do things how Christ did them. Let's be like Jesus. By the way, like John the Baptist as well, because he required fruit, meat for repentance. He said, bring forth therefore fruit, meat for repentance. When we don't follow these practices, when we don't let those waters back there, those baptismal waters, when we don't let them do their job and guard and protect this church, we corrupt it. Amen. And this is how doctrine gets lost. This is how you get lost people in churches. A church is supposed to be a spiritual body making spiritual decisions. But when lost people come in, then they start making, they may try. I'm not saying they're not even sincere, but they're not able to make spiritual decisions. So a church begins getting corrupted. This is why that's one of the guards to it. Now, look, let me back up and say, look, all we can do. Here's one thing I've learned in this last week, and I've known, but I've relearned it and, and even with more force, is that nobody, not one person, can know if any other person is saved, not one of us. We can't know if they're saved and we can't know if they're lost. Not one of us can know that. All we can do is look at the fruit they show us. So you tell me you've made a confession of faith. You say, yes, I've called on the Lord. I've repented. I've, I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. You say that. I say, okay, I believe you. But now I want to watch your life. I want to see if you bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. And what you show me, if you show me that you have, have, have evidenced salvation, we're not talking about any type of sinless perfection, nothing like that. I want to see that you, that you are changed, that God has come into you and He's changed you, He's changed your desires, that there's been repentance, that you're different. That's what we're looking for, because none of us are perfect. But I, I could get more into that, and I will. But that's what we're looking for, is that there's been a change in you. Fruit, meet for repentance. So we want to follow Jesus here. Here's what he said. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more what? 
Who did Jesus baptize? Well, who did he authorize to be baptized? Disciples. Disciples. Jesus only baptized disciples. What's a disciple? John 8, 31. Go ahead and turn there. And there's a lot that could be said about a disciple, but to me, this is the most concise definition of what a disciple is. Now, Jesus only baptized disciples, okay? And it wasn't him, it was his disciples. The apostles were the ones, soon to be the apostles. They were the ones doing the baptizing under the authority of Jesus Christ, okay? That's what verse 2 says. But it says that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. So a disciple, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So a disciple is somebody that continues in God's word. That's what we're looking for. That's what we want. That's what we're desiring. And that's all we can do. We can say we've heard your confession of faith. We see that you are living up to it. Okay, we'll receive you. But when we don't practice what we should, when we don't make sure that it's a disciple of Jesus Christ, we're not holding to the ordinances like we should. Paul said, keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Keep them as I delivered them to you. Those baptismal waters are a guard to this church. They protect this church. So does the Lord's table. It keeps this church pure within. The baptismal waters keep it pure from without. It guards who gets to come in. You see, not everybody gets to get baptized. Now, everybody that's made a profession of faith, that has, has asked Jesus Christ to save them, every single one of them should be baptized. But not every one of them is willing to be a disciple. Okay, we can go to Acts chapter 2, verses... Uh, 41 and 42, and it says, um, Then they that gladly received him were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. See, baptism adds you to that body. They were added to that church there in Jerusalem. But the next verse, verse 42, says, And they, who? Those 3,000 that were baptized, and they, what did they do? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread. When somebody joins this church, when they want to be a member here, before we will allow them to be a member here, because God has told the church, whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatsoever is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. The decisions we make here as a church are authoritative in heaven. Heaven recognizes the decisions that we make right here. Why? Because we are an embassy of the kingdom. The church is the kingdom. Amen. And we're an embassy of that kingdom. And we follow the kingdom's laws. So the decisions that we make here are bound in heaven. So it's serious stuff. It's not just some flippant thing that we get to do. No, it's serious. So what we're looking for is we want people that are serious minded. Before we will allow somebody to be a member here, because that decision is going to be bound in heaven. They have to prove to us that they're going to be faithful. That's what the Bible, that's the Bible example. They're a disciple, meaning they follow Jesus Christ. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So they're going to follow the Word of God. And they're going to be faithful, committed to Him. They continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine. So before we'll baptize anyone, if you're not going to be faithful to all the services, you must not want it. Say, how unfair. That, that's unfair. You shouldn't say that. No, you, we'll happily receive you when you're going to be committed to this body. Because look, when you get go through those baptismal waters, you're added to a body. Anybody here, you, hey, someone want to cut a finger off right now? So I don't really need it. Anybody? Toe? No, nobody? Eyelid? Just the tip of your nose? I mean, I got a knife in my pocket. I'm, I'm dead serious now. No one's going to say, I don't want to lose any parts of my body. No. -uh. See, faithfulness. Faithfulness. When this body assembles, we all need to be here. Amen. Those that were baptized on the day of Pentecost continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. It's serious stuff. Amen. It's not some plaything. We're not a social club. Amen. This is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and He's our head, our Savior, the one that died for us. We don't just play church here. That's not what we're doing. This is serious, and we need to treat it as serious, and those waters help to protect this church. Now, look, when I said all that, some people might say, they don't want anybody there. No, anyone can visit. 
keep coming. You can come as long as you want. As long as you're not causing problems, keep visiting until you grow and learn. And then you may one day say, you know what? That's right. I, I do need to do that. And praise the Lord. Be happy to have you. Praise the Lord. We will be happy to have you. But not until you've already proved it to us, until you're bringing forth fruit, meet for repentance. Not everybody has to agree with that. I know the other side of the arguments. I've heard them. I've seen them. Okay. That's what's a local church issue. That church can decide to do things how they want. But in order for us to guard this church and, and keep his, his body, his assembly pure, th these are the practices we put in place. Amen. And we want to make sure that we maintain that, that we keep that guard there. Um, as I go through this, we're going to talk about holiness. Holiness is a part of it. Righteousness. It, it, it's so important to it. But look, if you're a disciple and you've got something wrong in your life, but you're a disciple, when it's pointed out to you, you'll be like, that's right, I shouldn't do that. And as a brother or sister comes to you, you'll say, you're right. Pray for me. I need help getting that right. Pray for me. You'll do it because you're a disciple. And that's where the Lord's table comes in. You examine yourself. You look at your own life. You begin to purify your own life. You take of that table unworthily, people have died from it. Yeah, it's in the Bible. It's a serious thing. It's a serious thing.